Hi everyone, Dom Febular here, and I am back. This is incredible to have this opportunity, and here we are on Memorial Day, which is a wonderful holiday for everyone to enjoy, to pay tribute to all of those great service people that have came before us and that are continuing to serve for us, for us to have the freedoms that we have for sure here in America. So anyone that is listening to us from around the world, we thank you so much for joining us, and we are here at Mapex All Access and this is great. I get the chance each Monday at this time, 2 o'clock Eastern Standard Time, to bring in different people that I want everyone to kind of get familiar with and get to know. And Mapex, of course, has these incredibly great artists that we've had. And over the past several weeks, I have had some great, great fun introducing, introducing so many great, great people and interviewing them to find out about their lives. And today, it continues with some greatness. You know, from the Robert Earl Keane Band, we've got for you Tom Van Skyke. So let's please welcome Tom. Tom Thank you so much for joining me. Hello, Dom. How you doing? I am fantastic. You know, I mentioned that it's, it's a it's a holiday, so we'll see who can join us and what happens. Just to sit back and take this in. But this is the power of the internet that we have this access, Tom, from myself in New York. You're in Austin, Texas, and we can have this incredible clarity of what we're doing to share information with the world. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, we've done. We've done some live stream concerts over during the pandemic that um, we had people tuning in from Korea and and Australia and I mean just literally all over the world and uh, just you know using the technology to you know to its to its limits to, to expand and you know put put our stuff out there it's it's pretty amazing. Well, when you think about it, Tom, in in the years in, in in your upbringing, the tools that you had to work with compared to the tools that the younger younger you know, generation has to work with now, pretty different, right? Completely, completely. I mean, it's uh, you either went to a live show or you uh, saw somebody on Johnny Carson or uh, you bought the LP, and uh, if you wanted to learn what they were doing, you basically had to try to slow the LP down to figure out what notes were in there. And, and that was tough because everything sounded so boomy and horrible, <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, I mean, just, uh, you know, being able to access pretty much any performance on YouTube and, you know, even, you know, even isolated tracks, you know, I've, I've heard, you know, some of Bonham and Precaro's isolated tracks and it's just, you know, it's it's mind blowing that that technology is available to us now. I wish we had it when I was eighteen or sixteen. When we think about the times, and and, and I, I I get a kick out of it when I think about how hard we had to work to get information, how difficult it was to pick up that needle and keep on playing that track over and over, and how how it was to kind of you know pull this information. We had to fight for the knowledge. Today it's literally delivered to you on a silver platter with all the amount of you know reach that we have through the internet oh yeah i mean it's just it's every anything is at your fingertips these days yeah and uh you know if you're if you're transcribing a max roach solo or something you know you don't have to listen to it and figure out the sticking you can actually see it and it you know experience it you know right right on youtube and you know, it just makes everything so much easier. It is, it's so amazing because it, it, it has, you know, in today's world, it really delivers you exactly what is being done. Years ago, when I, at least for myself, when I tried to transcribe it, I was sometimes transcribing it incorrectly. When I heard Billy Cobham play with Mahavishnu, I didn't know that Billy was playing open-handed. So he was playing the hi-hat with his left hand and his right hand was moving around the tom. So when we heard that on the recording, we were trying to figure out how he crossed his hands to play some of those patterns. And it was really challenging until I finally went to see Billy live and said, oh my gosh, this is a, a mind blower now to the fact that he's playing open-handed and having the freedom of his right hand move around. It was it was really kind of changing how we how we learned. Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, I actually, when uh, a really good friend of mine and former teacher, uh, Rick Latham, uh, he's, he, when he was going to UNT, I studied with him like all during high school, um, uh, here in, in, uh, well up in Dallas. And, uh, when he was doing the transcriptions for his advanced funk studies, there was a couple, 
things that, you know, that he learned later on, it was just like, oh, this isn't this. It's actually, yeah. you know, you know, he's like, uh, uh, like on 50 ways to leave your lover or something that the integration of the hi-hat foot with the hi-hat. Yeah. It, it really, you know, there was no way to tell that from the recording, you know, <laughs> when you saw him playing it. Yeah. Okay. Now that, okay, that makes sense. And it's totally different, but you know, it wasn't a double left. It was actually a hi-hat and then a left, you know, <laughs> that type of thing. So, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's amazing. You know, it's, you know, like I said, I wish, I wish I had had that, you know, that available to me as, you know, as I was, as I was going through my studies. Well, there are definite advantages that this young generation has, but now, you know, you mentioned Rick Latham, who's a dear, dear friend also. So I want to go back a little earlier to, you know, when, when drums entered your life, you know, what, what got you involved in drumming and music in the first place? Um, well, uh, my mom always told me that I was one of those kids that was just banging on pots and pans. Um, you know, so when she was cooking dinner or something, she had one drawer down low that was full of junk pots and pans and stuff. And, um, you know, I would just sit there on the floor and pull something out and start banging on it. Um, she was a piano player and a church organist for a long time. So she would sit down and start playing the piano. And before I started actually taking lessons and stuff, I guess I was probably in first or second grade, um, I would take empty coffee cans and set them up like a drum set and I would have gone out in the woods and, you know, gotten some sticks and whittled them down. Those were my drumsticks. And uh, then uh, when I was, this was actually when I was living in Connecticut at the time and they started a uh, band in fourth grade. So when it came time to, you know, to choose an instrument, I was just like, oh yeah, it's drums, you know, no doubt. And uh, yeah, just studied from then on, moved to Dallas when I was in uh, fifth grade, um, studied all through high school, did the band, orchestra, did everything, you know, that was available musically and uh, went on to UNT and studied up there. Let's talk about the school system in, as, as a, in, in your formative years in the school band. How influential and how important was that school band to you to play? Yeah, how did that develop your skills? Oh, it was, I mean, it, it's basically what set my entire course for the rest of my life. Um, I actually went to a private school in Dallas. My dad was a, uh, the head of the science department at St. Mark's School of Texas, which is a private boys' school in Dallas. And um, I was actually really fortunate. It, you know, it was a smaller student body but the band director um, was a, a, a woodwind player, but he was totally into jazz. He was touring with the Dorsey brothers when he was just like 17. And so he did all that and then he went into the army and then came out and started teaching. And the director of the orchestra actually studied at the Paris Conservatory and it was this incredible cello player. So even though it was a smaller, uh, student body, I had these two huge influences of just incredible musicianship. And um, so, yeah, they, they, I guess they saw something in me and then really, really sort of, you know, pushed me and helped me expose me to different things. Um, Cause usually you would only start like in the, in the, you know, in the jazz band or the stage band when you were like in ninth or 10th grade or something, my band director put me in, in the eighth grade. And just to learn from the older guys who were, you know, just, you know, they're, they were great players too. So I, I came from this lineage of really good drummers coming through that school as well. Um, but yeah, I mean, and even just sort of life lessons. When I was in high school, I was already, uh, playing around uh, Dallas and doing a lot of theater work and stuff and, and doing some, you know, some jazz gigs and some lounge gigs. And when I was a senior, I would just come kind of dragging into my band director's office in the morning, kind of going, man, I was, I got home at two and I still had to do my homework and blah, 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 blah. blah. And, you know, just complaining. And, you know, we were sitting there drinking coffee and he just leaned back in his chair and kind of go, so you want to be a musician? <laughs> 
<laughs> so, you know, to this day, any time that, you know, it's just like, oh, my God, I have a, you know, a 6 a.m. flight and I get in and I have to do this and we have sound check and I got to, you know, it's I just have that voice in my head of, so you want to be a musician? <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, that was the upbringing in the in in the high school and, and during, you know, fr probably from fifth grade until, uh, until 12th grade was, was, was in majorly influential. So, and, and that was different types of music, right? Were you involved with any marching band at all at that time? Or? Didn't really do the marching band. Um, I was, you know, I did all the rudiments and stuff just uh, through my private teachers. I had a series of really great private teachers. Um, the first drum set teacher and actually first private teacher I had um, in Dallas was actually the top call for the studio stuff in Dallas. And at the time, uh, Dallas was like the, the jingle capital of the world. There was more, you know, more radio jingles and stuff being cut in Dallas than anywhere else. Um, so he got me really into you know, my, sort of my timing and precision and really worked, you know, with, with me on the rudiments. And how, how old were you then? Uh, fifth grade. And, and who was that now again? Uh, it was a guy named Brad Smith. Hmm. And he went on to move out to Nashville and played with a bunch of people out in Nashville. Gary Morris, I remember he played with him uh, during uh, Gary's career. Um, and unfortunately, I've kind of lost touch with him in the, you know, in the last... De I guess decades now. <laughs> hopefully, hopefully, from this interview, you can track him down again and, and thank. I him. hope so. Yeah, yeah. The last last time I, he he actually uh, got into hunting and making bows and and stuff like that. So he might be out off the grid in Colorado for all I know. So, <laughs> you know. Good for him. So so this is so. Did you go through any with some of your private teachers? Did you go through any? Books per se, or what were what were they working with you on? Oh yeah, I mean we we did the stick control. Um, uh, gosh, the you know everything from realistic rock to you know just just through sort of all the seventies eighties plethora of books. Uh, you know Chapin's book. You know we were working with that, and uh, when I was studying with Rick. Um, he would actually bring in these, you know, exercises and transcriptions and have me work on them. And then right. after I'd been working on those, he came, came in one day and plopped the book down and he was just like, all right, this is what you've been working on. I was like, Oh, cool. <laughs> <laughs> Rick is great. Still doing it stronger than ever. And, uh, oh man, I love him to death. I just, you know, he and I just, uh, Message back and forth uh, a couple of weeks ago on my birthday, so it was, it was good. I think he just moved. Actually, he just moved back to North Carolina. So, oh, did he really? Yeah. Well, he was yeah. he was in L.A. for the longest time, then he went. To he was in L.A. for a long, LA. long time, and then from Italy back to L.A., and now he's back in the in the Carolinas. That's fantastic. Yeah. Well, how great! So, in in, in this point, so you you kind of working with there any drummers that you were listening to at this time that were kind of influencing you? Um. I would say everybody, um, you know, the, you know, the rock stuff. I was, you know, I was definitely into Bonham. Uh, the first band that I played with in high school was uh, this horn band that, so we did all of Chicago and Blood, Sweat and Tears. Right. So I was, uh, you know, Danny Serafin was just, you know, God to me, you know, just learning all of those tunes. He was, he was incredible. And, and I had the pleasure of meeting him at about, I guess, about five or six years ago. He came in and did a clinic, and and uh, I was uh, sitting there with Todd Superman, who was a good friend of his. So we got to we got to hang out after the clinic for a while. So well, how, that was how great is Danny and 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 you mentioned Todd too. Great, great players, great guys, and how influential was that band Chicago when you were growing up, right? Oh my God, it was, it was everything. Cause I mean, they rocked out, but they still, you know, and I was at the time I was just sort of getting into the jazz thing and the big band thing with the, you know, with the, you know, with the stage band and stuff like that. And the way, the way he can incorporate sort of the jazz in, you know, the jazz playing and all of the complex stuff that especially that they did on their first couple of records into, you know, the rock idiom was just, I mean, it was mind blowing. 
Boy, it's, it's so amazing how these great, great players that have influenced at younger ages. So, so at that time, so were there any other drummers that specifically you were honing in on at that time? Um, probably the the two in high school. The two main ones were probably Steve Gadd and Jeff Percaro. Wow. Um, because uh, when I was taking lessons with Rick, there would always be this. I don't know if he did it on purpose, but he would always, always have some free time after my lesson. So we would have the lesson, then we'd go and make a make you know some coffee, and then he would we would just sit around and listen to whatever LPs came out that week or that month with Precaro and Gad on it. And you know that was the that was the time where you could actually look at the back of the record and see the studio musicians who were playing on the record, so you knew. You know, that's that's how I, you know, got most of my record collection. It was just kind of seeing who was playing on it. I didn't care who the artist was per se, but it's just like, oh, this has got Gad on it. I have to listen to it. Well, it yeah. wasn't amazing at, at that time and how we listen to music and how on these these albums, these LPs, the information of the songs was there, you know, who what musicians were on there, who produced it, who sang on it. I mean, just it was so great to have all that information to get to know who was who were these great legends behind the great legends? You know? Oh yeah, absolutely. And uh, I guess one of the other people that um, when I was studying with Brad early on, he was, he was a big Russ Kunkel fan mm -hmm. and which, you know, you know, is, is obvious. So I was definitely exposed to Russ and uh, I've had the privilege of uh, becoming friends with Russ over the last, gosh, I guess 15 years. He's, he's, played with, uh, he's been in the drum seat with uh, Lyle Lovett for a, uh, for a number of years. Yeah. And Lyle and Robert went to went to Texas A&M together. So we've done a bunch of shows together over the years. So I've gotten to hang out with Russ a lot. And uh, that, was, that was, to me, that was one of the pinch me moments because he was such an influence. And then all of a sudden it's just like, oh, wow, he's my friend now. <laughs> <laughs> it's just like, oh my God, this is just, I mean, it's, it's just mind blowing. And those that really don't know the name Russ Kunkel, I mean, Russ recorded for everybody and just played on so many great hits and just a solid, solid player and, and a great, great musician. And very, very tasteful in, and I've, I've actually gone, since I've, you know, gotten to know him, I've actually gone back and listened to it, uh, all the records that I have that he played on. And it was so amazing how tasteful he was and how, he picked textures. He was, he was like one of the first people to, uh, when he was recording with James Taylor to use brushes on, you know, a rock track. Yeah. And just, just because, you know, and you, you know, listening to like fire and rain or something like that. And you're thinking, wow, if he played this with sticks, it would have been a completely different yeah. feel, yeah. you know, but he just had this innate capability of, finding the right texture to fit with whatever songwriter, whether it was Carol King or, you, you know, you name it, but uh, Jackson Brown, you know, Linda Ronstadt, you know, everybody. And he just had this unique thing of finding these, these little places to where, you know, he could add just a tiny little something that, you know, that was very subtle, but it, it helped make the tune. It's, it's so amazing when, when, what you're, what you're explaining here is how you've done the research to step into that person's playing, to listen to them, and really do the homework to get to know their playing, how they're expressing themselves, and how respectful they are to the tune to serve the song and give what's best for the song in the process. It's pretty amazing how you've done that kind of homework. Oh, well, I mean, a lot of that came through uh, my, my teaching, you know, whether I was... Uh, uh, teaching in a, in a school or I did a lot of private lessons from the time I was a senior in high school, you know, for a number of years. And I would always, you know, you know, somebody would bring in like, a, you know, a track with Stuart Copeland or Larry Mullen Jr. or somebody. And it was just like, I want to learn how to do this. I want to learn how to do this. And I was just like, okay, I'll teach you how to do it technically, but you have to do the homework and tell me why, you know, why they're playing this particular fill in this place. What, what does that add to it? And then, you know, try to, you know, just as an experiment, I would try to have them play, you know, just, a, uh, 
you know, just play a regular rock beat. If it was something, something different, I would just have them play a regular rock beat and record it and say, listen back and see how that completely changed the team. Well, you, you really have allowed, you know, you, you've done your homework and you allowed yourself to become very, very aware of great, great players and what they've done so you can be influenced by them, which is exactly the homework that needs to be done. So you end up going to UNT. What was that yeah. like? When, when you went there, what was that like? And who were some of the teachers that were there at the time? Oh, uh, gosh. Uh, when I first started, it was it was pretty eye-opening because, you know, being in the private school, I was kind of like the, the big fish in the little pond. And I got up there and it was just like, oh, my God, there's so many freaking amazing players up here. <laughs> Um, uh, I was up there when, uh, Mitch Marine was up there who, who now plays with, uh, Dwight Yoakam. He's a good buddy of mine. Yeah. Uh, Greg Bissonette had just finished, uh, not too long before, um, Dan Wojciechowski, who plays with, uh, Peter Frampton now, um, you know, all these, all these great, great players, you know, so it was, it was a little, uh, you know, I, I think I was the first semester, it was like deer in the headlights. You know, <laughs> I was just, I was like, oh my God, what have I gotten myself into? But, uh, <laughs> but I, you know, I found my place up there, which was great because it's, um, I always say that UNT, uh, and at the time I started, it was actually North Texas State University. Yeah. Um, but it turned me from being a drummer into being a musician. Yeah which really helped later on in in my teaching because you know when i was teaching at the uh arts magnet high school in dallas i was actually teaching like second year music theory and ear training and all that other stuff wow. and um it's helped me you know most recently because i'm i'm also robert's uh, music director as well i've been his music director for like the last four years oh interesting so, you know, that, that background has helped me, you know, just be able to write out vocal parts, to do, do this, to turn, you know, to write out charts, all that stuff. It's really, it's really helped me there. Um, from a drumming perspective, uh, Colin Bailey was still up there when I was, uh, when I was yeah. started. Yeah. Um, Henry Oxtell, who, you know, he was a UNT legend. I think he's, he great. should be in the UNT Hall of Fame. He was a great amazing. player, great teacher. Absolutely, Henry. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. I mean, his, you know, I mean, there, there were times where we'd sit down for lessons and we'd just talk, you yeah. know, and it was just, it was amazing. Um, and of course, uh, you know, Dr. Troma and Ron Fink were the two main professors up there. And, and I'm still, in, you know, I still keep in touch with Ron and, I see Doc every now and again, so it's. Uh, oh, fantastic! Yeah. Was Ed, was Ed Sof there at that time too? No, he came in. He he actually came in. His first semester was my last semester, oh, so I didn't get to do a whole lot of studying with him. But I've uh, a couple of my students when I was teaching in Navarro College, uh, uh, which was a two year like a junior college they actually transferred up to UNT. So they got to study with Ed and I would, I would be in touch with Ed about, you know, just giving, you know, letting them know, you know, who the, who the kids were and, you know, where they were at and all that other stuff. So we've, you know, we've definitely kept in touch over the years as well. So at North Texas State, as it was called at that time, and at UNT, what was it like, you know, when you were there, you know, what were you working on? Were they giving you charts? Were they giving you more books to learn out of? What was the, what was the general curriculum? Everything. Um, they would have they would have certain books um, for certain years that you were there. Like they would have freshman freshman barriers, sophomore barriers. You know, for each year you were there, they would have different barriers that you would have to pass on these books in order to go to the next the next level of books. You know, so it started. Uh, I think the first year it was like uh, Ron Fink had a big band reading book, and then. Chapin's advanced techniques and then something else. And that was for drum set. Um, but the thing about UNT too, is that if you were like deficient in timpani or snare drum, even though you were a jazz major, um, you had to take, you had to pass your deficiency barriers before you could study drum set. So it was all about becoming a percussionist and an all around player as opposed to just playing drum set for 10 hours a day. 
Well, that's absolutely great to, in, in preparation because I'm sure that has helped you on in doing what you're doing now. I mean, just those skills oh, yeah. and those, you know, just that that mind opening process of seeing music differently. Very helpful. Yeah. Yeah. Like I said, it, it, you know, like I said before, it turned me into a musician and totally broadened my, uh, my perspective of what that is. Yeah. Um, and it's not just, it's not just timekeeping, you know, you're, you're in, you know, playing the classical percussion stuff. It sort of exposed me to all these different textures. And you had to play, you know, you had to do percussion ensembles as yeah. well as your small groups, which, you know, uh, you know, like I said, it just different, different sounds and textures and influences from that. Um, but for the jazz stuff, it was, it was a lot of, at the time, it was a lot of technique working out of Dahlgren, working out of, uh, you know, uh, Rick's book was up there as well, but like the audition process was pretty much all sight reading. Well, you, you mentioned the Dahlgren book, which is the uh, uh, Marv Dahlgren and Elliot Fine's four-way coordination book. Yeah. And, you know, that book, you know, and having gone through the Jim Chapin book, which is an independence jazz, you know, that kind of prepares you to kind of lead you into the Marv Dahlgren and Elliot Fine book, four-way coordination. So that's great that you had that level of guidance that is just so clear and it's leading you right down a path of, of, of music. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and their, you know, the way their curriculum was based was, you know, like you said, each book kind of led into the yeah. next one. Each year led into the next year. So by the time you got up to a certain point, you know, there would, we would be studying uh, out of some of the Chafee pattern books and doing doing some things like that. And um, so yeah, it was it was a it was a great experience, um, and it really opened my eyes and got, got my playing together, um, technically. And I think one of the, the, one of the most beneficial things for me was that the entire time that I was going to school, I was playing in Dallas and Fort Worth. Yeah. I was playing like, you know, anywhere from three to five nights a week, every week in Dallas. So I had like the, the school education and then I had the, the real world education. <laughs> You know, how to get how to get a gig, how to keep a gig, you know, that type of thing. So what was it? You know, were you meeting musicians at school or just starting to get together with them? How, how was word getting out? Um, I had actually started when I was in high school. I was doing I started off doing a lot of theater work. So I was doing working in the local and the regional theaters in Dallas and Fort Worth and uh, just playing everything from, you know, uh, shows like Pippin or Annie or Godspell to Ain't Misbehavin' and Gypsy. And um, so, yeah, wearing a lot of different stylistic hats within, you know, within that theater group, because each one you sort of have to adjust to the different type of musical it was. You know, I wouldn't bring and play the same way for Godspell as I would for Ain't Misbehavin'. You know, so you sort of had to fit stylistically into the the era and the the style that the music was written in. So you're at UNT. You're starting to work doing some gigs, and you're starting to meet some musicians. You're starting to really kind of step into this professional business now that's building and growing. Yeah, yeah. And uh, a lot of it is contacts, you know. And that's uh, it, uh, reminds me that. Uh, this manager, Ken Cragen, who used to manage uh, Trish Yearwood and gosh, I forget all these huge mega stars. Um, he put out a book called Life as a Contact Sport. Yeah. And that's that's one of the things that I always, I always tell people. It's just like, you know, having those contacts that you make on gigs that even just, you know, casual contacts or, you don't know if, you know, somebody you're playing with on a one-off gig might call you a year from now for a tour or for a session or, um, you know, one example is that um, Lloyd Maines, who's the uh, music director for the uh, Austin City Limits Hall of Fame, uh, he does the awards, we do the award shows every year. And he's called me for numerous sessions over the years and he calls me every year to play uh, the hall of fame shows 
but I met him back in 90, oh gosh, uh, 92, maybe 93. He came in and played on a Dixie Tricks record that I was playing on and played a bunch of shows with us. And he's actually Natalie's dad. So this was even before Natalie joined the band. Yeah. Um, but he, he called me um, when I left the Dixie Chicks about a year after I left the, left the band, he called me just out of the blue and it was just like, Hey, what are you doing this weekend? And I was just like, I don't have any, you know, I'm just playing some gigs. What do you got going? He goes, well, Robert, Robert Earl Keen needs a drummer to cover this five day run into the Northeast. Can you do it? it just, and I was like, sure. Have him call me. So the next day he, you know, you know, came totally off of Lloyd's recommendation to Robert. And then Robert talked to me, sent me CDs. I made, he gave me a 40 song set list to learn. That was Monday. I met everybody at the airport on Thursday, Friday, we were playing in New York city. <laughs> so, and that was 24 years ago and I'm still here. That's baptism by fire for sure. In the press. Oh yeah. But if it but if it wasn't for Lloyd and knowing him before and him knowing what I'm about, he would not have felt comfortable recommending me to Robert, who has gamefully employed me for the last 24 years. It's what's amazing is the story, and, and you mentioned a name who I happen to have known very well, Ken Cragen. Mm -hmm. Ken Cragen was an incredible, you know, manager slash producer involved, and he managed Michael Jackson. He managed Ken. Yeah. Uh, he managed Harry Chapin. Harry Chapin, the great Harry Chapin, yeah. is from Long Island here, who I met many, many years ago. And Harry Chapin, I was taking lessons with Jim Chapin at the time, who wrote the book that you mentioned, Advanced Techniques for the Modern Drummer, yeah. late 60s, and got to meet Harry at that time because Harry was Jim's son and putting his band together and Cats in the Cradle and all these songs came out of that. So Ken Cragen, a very, very powerful force. And that book that you mentioned, uh, you know, it, it's a contact sport, is a very, very good reading material understand the craziness of this music industry it's uh yeah i mean it's it's important it, and that sort of uh i actually uh used that book and also i took a uh, uh there was a community college in dallas that i was actually offering a music of business course mm. so in my time at unt i took a semester and a summer off from my studies and you know, I just sort of took some solids at the community college and I took some music classes too. And one of them was a business of music class. Yeah. And it went through everything from, you know, you know, the roles of agents and managers and, and dealing with record companies to, you know, all, all kinds of stuff. And that's and the teacher that is who, you know, gave me Craven's book. And it's, you know, that, that part of the, the music business is, you know, is overlooked too much by players, in my opinion. You need to have some business chops as much as you need your, you know, your playing chops. Well, that's it's such a great, great balance point of what it is. And it, it is absolutely necessary to understand the business part of what this is, hence the music business. And you want to be able to understand how to network people, how to manage yourself, how to put this all together. I mean, those are great, great points to go into. So how did you, how did you hook up with the Dixie Chicks? How did that come about? Um, that was actually through contacts too. Um, uh, even when I was a uh, senior in high school, I played a show, uh, called Dames at Sea at a local theater. And the lead in the show was Robin Macy, who was one of the original, uh, four, when the Dixie Tricks first started, they were four girls just playing bluegrass and Western swing. Yeah. And so I had played that show with her and it was like, you know, six or eight week run or something like that. So we, you know, we became friends years pass. Um, and I just sort of opened up the local paper and saw her picture with the, you know, as the Dixie chicks. And I was like, Oh my God, that's Robin. So they were playing at this little Italian, restaurant bar place called Joey Tomatoes in Dallas, you know, it was one of their first indoor gigs because they started out on the street corner. And uh, so I went in and, and, you know, sort of went up to say hi to Robin and she, you know, and so we, we caught up, she introduced me to everybody else. And, you know, we talked in between sets and, and I, 
you know, at the end of the night, I just, I gave him my card and I said, Hey, if you ever want to put drums, I think you guys are incredible. If you ever want to put drums on a record or something, please keep me in mind. So like literally a month later, um, they called, uh, I got a call from Robin and they were going to record a Christmas 45, which for you younger people, a 45 is like an LP shrunk down with yeah. only two songs on it. Um, so we went in, I went in for a pre-production rehearsal, um, like, you know, two days before the session and, um, played through the stuff and worked up the stuff. And, and during that time they were like, Hey, you know, why don't we try this song with drums? Why don't we try that song with you? So I, I basically went through their entire repertoire that night. And then after the session, about two weeks later, they called me again and said, we're opening up for Michael Martin Murphy at this arena. We want you to come play. <laughs> Excuse me. Yeah. And so probably a month and a half later, I was working full time for him. Unbelievable. When you think about just the, the preparation and the context that you've met and just the, the fact of where you were, but you were always delivering music at a high level. You were always giving your all. You were always playing it well. You were always well prepared. I think those are important qualities for people to understand. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You have to go. You have to go in prepared. Um, and that's that's one of the things that I you know I always tell my students to over prepare because if you're you know if you're doing a show or something um, just you know it's like a one off show your nerves are gonna sort of decrease you know your your capabilities and things so if you over prepare you're still gonna be at a super high level yeah you know if you just barely kind of have your stuff together then it there's train wrecks possible, you know? <laughs> so, uh, and I think that's one of the things that, you know, with, with Lloyd's that he calls, you know, that he keeps calling me for the hall of fame shows is that I come in, I mean, first rehearsal and I know everything backwards and forwards, you know, and, uh, just, you know, for him and being a music director and hiring these people, <coughs> excuse me, it, uh, you know, it puts him at ease because he knows that I'm going to deliver a certain quality of product. And, uh, and that's, you know, to me, that's, that's how you sort of get all the, all the calls again. So when they, when they send you tunes, do they send you charts? Are they sending you just the files? Are you listening to it? Are you writing your own charts? How do you prepare for this? Um, basically Lloyd, Lloyd will get with uh, like all the guest artists and, um, he'll have the songs that, that they want to perform. And so we'll go on, you know, YouTube and find links of, you know, the different, you know, of the tunes. And so what I'll do is, is go to the, like the original studio recording of something and listen to that and chart that out. But then if it's like, if I'm playing, uh, you know, like with Cheryl Crow and we're doing one of her songs, I'll also search out some live versions to see if there's any differences between the studio version and the live version and make those notes. And then we'll get together as just the house band and rehearse, you know, just our part. And then during dress rehearsals are usually the first time that we actually rehearse with the artist. And um, I'll, I'll usually have, you know, like a little cheat sheet, but I'll have the tempo, I'll have the key, I'll have, you know, whatever, you know, whatever I need to know on just a little cheat sheet for that tune. Yeah. And uh, then you just kind of go with it and see what happens. So you'll put these songs onto a little, a little, a little chart based on your own so you'll have access to them. But I mean, this really is great preparation that you'll have because you're playing a variety of different songs for a variety of different artists in the Austin City Limits Hall of Fame. Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, we'll we'll be playing with everybody from uh, Willie Nelson and Chris Christopherson to Elvis Costello to Cheryl Crow to Gary Clark Jr. to uh, Gosh Rosie and Cash. Um, I mean, it's you know you never know. You never, you know, we never know who's going to be on it until probably about a month before the show. And, uh, you know, and, and uh, you know, we did a Ray Charles tribute and I, and I got to play with Nora Jones. 
which was which was great because she was actually a student at the Arts Magnet in Dallas when I was a teacher there. Nice. So so yeah, we had a we had a really we had a great reunion at that at that show. So that was a lot of fun. Well, how beautiful how you meet people through the course of your of your life and how you're doing it. We got a couple of people that are here that have joined us from Ecuador, from Europe, from Mexico, from all throughout the U.S., from out in L.A., New York, from Florida. We've got some great, great people. I want to show you this one question here from Carson Groenwold. What is your process of playing a Jay Belarus recorded drum part live? Oh, wow. What would be my process? That's a good question. <laughs> um, <laughs> Thanks, Carson. Um, pretty much with anything. If, if I'm playing like something somebody else recorded, um, the first thing I'll do is sort of listen to their overall approach of how they of how they approach the tune, like kind of like we, what we talked about before, why they, you know, what fill they played when and why. Yeah. Yeah. Um, then I'll actually listen to the, the sounds that they got um, on the record, recording the record mm -hmm. and through whatever, you know, whatever tricks I can use to try to, to simulate that as closely as I can. You know, it could be something from putting tea towels on toms to, um, you know, just using different different pair, you know, using a, a pair of rods instead of, uh, you know, instead of sticks or, you know, something like that. Just to just to try to emulate the, you know, the general the general sound of the track. And then I'll really dive in deep to the feel that they're getting. Yeah. And really try to, you know, try to get that as close as I can to, you know, what the, you know, what the artist is that I'm, that I'm supporting because, you know, as a side man, as a backing musician, that's my primary responsibility is to make the artist feel comfortable. And that is, you know, it's, it's a sort of a very, it's gotta be a very selfless approach to it. To where you know i'm not thinking about well I'm, i need to play this i've been working on this lake and i'm gonna fit this in here it's like no this you know my my job in in those situations is to make the artist feel as comfortable as possible in that moment well that's so great that you had that level of professionalism tom to really be able to to step into the world and, and deliver to these artists exactly what they're looking for and that's really is what listen that's why you're as busy as you are. That's why you're, you're still with Robert for all these years. You're really delivering a high level of professionalism, which is so, so important today. Here's another question from a great uh, a great drummer in uh, in the Miami area in Florida. Carlos is a dear friend. He's also a phenomenal drummer. And a, and he, he drum techs for, for everyone from uh, from Max Weinberg to, you know, my gosh, all these different incredible, incredible top, top drummers. Tom, has your basic drum set evolved over the years? And I'm observing some electronic pads in the back. You know, do you incorporate electronics into your setup? Um, you're very observant, Carlos. <laughs> Those are some electronic pads. Um, I have a rolling kit set up back there as well for uh, when I want to practice and not disturb, you know, my wife if she's on a, a Zoom call in the other room or whatever. Um, actually, when we were getting the house together, I, I was living in an apartment and that's all I had to practice on. So that was, you know, I try to be a good neighbor as well as a good drum. <laughs> um, but uh, yes, my, my setup has changed over the years. Um, for a long time, I was using uh, sort of bigger drums. Uh, I was using like 22, you know, this is basically just with Robert's uh, gig. But I was using like 22 by 18 and then a 12 and a 16 floor tom <coughs> and crash cymbals, china, you know, splash. Um, and about five years ago, Robert wanted to bring the stage volume down a whole lot. So um, I actually called up uh, Russ Kunkel and to see what he had been using on the road with Lyle. And so I went to a 20 inch kick 
and then a, a 10, 12, 14 toms. Right. And I'm basically down to two symbols. Just I'm using the Sabian uh, HHX Omni rides. Mm -hmm. And uh, because they're both rides and crashes, they're yeah. super versatile and I love them. Um, so I'm using that and then just one ozone crash just for an effect. So it's everything's kind of, uh, you know, scaled down a little bit size wise. But um, and at that point, I went to, you know, like two rack, two rack toms and a floor tom. Mm -hmm. um, as for the electronics, yeah, I've been using, um, I originally started using the Roland SPDS like years ago because I had played, I had done a, a record of Roberts where I was using some loops that, that we, I recorded this train beat with brushes and then we ran it through a bunch of effects um, for, um, it was a song called Train Trek and it was sort of this weird um, 13 verse no chorus song that, um, that was based on a train but somehow developed, or a train crash that developed into a spaceship crashing somehow in the middle of these 13 verses. So my idea was that I was gonna do this loop and then run it through all these effects so it sounded kind of like a train chugging along, you know, and that would run through the, the entire thing. So when we, after we, the, the record came out, Robert was like, hey man, uh, how are we gonna do this live? <laughs> and, um, I saw that the SBDS had just come out, so I, I got one and started messing with it. And I've been using loops and, uh, you know, all that stuff in our live shows, you know, ever since. Well, it's amazing how you really kind of adapted to uh, to to apply the kit to where you were doing. Let's talk about, about Mapex. You've got the Mapex in the back there. Which, which mm -hmm. kit is that? Um, this is actually the Mars kit. <clears throat> the Mars series. Um, yeah. It's a uh, it's a bop kit, which is an 18 inch kick drum, and it comes standard with a 10 and 14 floor. And I added the 12 inch um, because um, I was I use this uh, when we do live streams and stuff out at Robert's Video Studio, to where it's you know I need I need a little bit more sound control, yeah. and it's not as you know, full out is a full live show. And so it's, it's the perfect kit for that. And, and it's in the driftwood finish. And uh, yeah, I mean, they, you know, the, the Mars series is, I mean, it records, it sounds great on the recordings. It, it, so, really, it really does. Yeah. I've, I've played the kit before. So, but that's, so do you have any other kits that you'll use, you know, in, in, in the, in the fact of uh, adapting to when I mean, you're doing a larger show touring? Um, you know, the, the touring kit that I'm using with Robert is just <clears throat> basically the five piece, you know, that I described with the 20 inch kick. Good. Um, I have, uh, my, my old road kit is a, uh, a Saturn and my current road kit is the Saturn exotic series in the, in the maple. And then my, one of my old road kits is a Saturn in the root beer burst, which is one of my favorite finishes ever. That was like the most amazing finish that Mapex ever did, in my opinion. <laughs> um, and uh, years ago, they uh, when the when uh, Mapex had the Deep Forest series, um, I got one of the the Deep Forest Cherry kits. And um, at the time, they were just like, "Hey, man, we want to get some of these out on the road. Can you do this?" And I was just like, "Yeah." And and by six months six months into it, I was just like this kit is too beautiful to be out on the road. So, <laughs> so that's retired. That's my main studio kit. If I, that's, that's my, you know, primary, you know, session kit. Um, when, if I just get called for, you know, sort of a, you know, X, Y, Z session. Yeah. Um, but usually I'll call it, I'll, I'll get with the producer ahead of time and just find out the general vibe of the record or something like that and sort of adjust my setup that way as, a, uh, as well. Whether um, I'm using, uh, you know, sort of vintage kit or, um, you know, if it needs to be bigger or smaller sounding or acoustic or, you know, just, just, so, I bring, just so I bring the right gear. Boy, it's so fantastic that you, that you really kind of, you know, 
see what you need for the gig. You kind of adapt for it. You kind of, you know, you, you really are, are such a pro. You know, here's, look at this here. Here's Ted Curtis, you know, a Robert right. fan from Buffalo. Yeah. <laughs> we were, I think we were just up there before the, God, it had to been 2019 now. We were up there and uh, we played a show in Buffalo. I think that was the last time we were up there. So, yeah, we're uh, we're starting to get out and getting some some touring and festival dates coming up. So we're you know we're going to be starting to hit the road again. Well, Ted is a is a huge huge fan. Here he just goes. I love everything you did on Farm Fresh Onions. Oh wow! Thank you, <laughs> thank you. Yeah, that was that was a, that was a fun record. That was uh, um, the the title of the record comes from. Uh, a bet that Robert had with his wife that he came back with, uh, we were playing a show down in the Valley of Texas and he came back with a, a bag of grapefruit from down there. And the bag actually said farm fresh onions on it. And so his wife dared him to write a song called farm fresh onions. So he did. Um, and it ended up being the title track, but, uh, but yeah, that was, that was one of the first, that was, that was the, you know, each one of Robert's records is always different. Um, that was the first one that we, he wanted more of a, sort of a rock, more of a rock feel to it. And um, just just more about the, you know, rock and groove and all this other stuff on it. Um, and then, you know, a couple records later, we did one called Ready for Confetti that in, you know, when I talked to Robert and uh, Lloyd Maines, who was producing it, uh, beforehand um, about, you know, what gear to bring. And he goes, I don't want to, I don't want any symbols on this record. <laughs> I was like, you're kidding, right? And he goes, no, I'm serious. I don't want any symbols on this record. So I was like, okay. You yeah. know, so it's, it's going to be more of an acoustic record and it's all about sounds and this, that, and the other thing. So that was, that was a lot of fun for me because, you know, I, you, you're just not crashing you know, you know, okay, it's the start of a chorus. You're going to hit a crash. You have, you have to sort of like think outside of your brain that you've been playing with for 30 years. And it's just like, okay, I have to rethink everything I'm doing at this point. So we got to play, play around with a lot of cool sounds and, you know, just come up with some different things. So that, that was a blast too. Boy, how great to keep your mind open and step into levels of creativity that you'd never thought you'd be able to, to, to you know experience so that's fantastic <laughs> you gotta play the gig man <laughs> <laughs> that's really what it comes out to you want to deliver deliver what the boss wants here's a keep them happy <laughs> that's the rio grande valley where valley percussion festival is from this is gil garcia who's a phenomenal drummer and dedicated to uh to keeping percussion going by organizing the valley percussion festival and thanks for joining us gil oh yeah thanks gil <laughs> Boy, that's amazing how you deliver what you delivered, Tom. You, you, you really are at a, a high level of performance. You're, 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 you're still at the, at the, really at the cusp of you creating with this band. You've been, you know, the, the band's probably a, a core of a real family atmosphere that when you go, oh, yeah. really is great to ex experience and express yourself because you're with family members. Yeah, I mean, I've been with this band longer than I've been with my wife right now you know uh, for even just number of years but uh but yeah i mean it's it's definitely you know after after 24 years or shoot even after the first five years it was it was definitely family and i've been super fortunate because robert for a solo artist and a and a singer songwriter he approaches the entire thing as a band mm. um he, you know, he makes sure that, you know, our needs are taken care of and it's not just sort of the like sidemen or a dime a dozen. We can get whoever to replace whoever if they don't like it, you know, it's he, you know, he makes sure we're taken care of and we're, we're happy. And, you know, and so for, because of that, we give him our 110% and, you know, our loyalty for the last couple decades. Well, it's pretty powerful in, in how you've done this here too, and, and you really have continued to to deliver this. The band's going stronger than ever. You'll be hitting the road soon, and and the fact that Robert handles this like a business, where he treats you guys with great respect, and you you feel like you are in a secure situation 
where you want to deliver your best every single time. That really is a great combination. Yeah, I mean it's it's a perfect combination, and it it makes I think it makes everybody relaxed um, because you know over the years I've gotten calls from different artists who you know have the reputation of firing their band every six months or something like that, and it's just like why would I do that, you know? And it and it allows me to be comfortable enough to where. You know, it allows me to do other things, but it allows me to feel comfortable enough to where I can be as creative as, as I can with, you know, with Robert. And it makes him comfortable enough to know that he's going to have a consistent product yeah. behind him every single night yeah. yeah, that he trusts, you know, and that's that's the you know, that's the that's the main main thing with the band, I think. And that level of security really is what's guaranteeing the success because you guys are out there hitting it hard, doing a hundred plus dates a year that that are that that is active for the band. You'll be getting back on the road soon. When when's the you think when when's the, the beginning part of the first gig of tour gonna start? Um we've been actually doing some shows since uh, actually we've been doing social distance shows since last fall, just here spot spot things here and there. Yeah. Um, I know we're doing um, a couple festival things coming up uh, this summer. Um, I think we just had a, a few things come up with the Avid Brothers that we're going to be doing. Um, so yeah, probably I'm I'm hoping by late summer everything's going to be in in full full road mode at that point. Oh, that is fantastic! Well, at some point. You've got to make sure when you get to the New York area, let me know what you're, what you're in the area. We'll get together for sure. I'll come out in the morning. Oh, I will definitely give you a call, Dom. That is fantastic. This sounds so exciting, and you've got tons of fans out there that we've experienced just today alone from all around the world. This goes live to Facebook and YouTube. It'll be posted on Facebook later on, and, of course, Mapex will post this on their YouTube channel. So we'll keep on sharing this so people can get the word out. It's fantastic, Tom. You really have an incredible incredible situation that you've, that you've earned by putting in the time and learning the instrument, and you have really have put in some great educational hard work to get to where you are, and it has paid off and continues to pay off with the success that you're experiencing. Well, thank you, Dom. I appreciate it, man. It's been it's been an honor to finally be able to talk to you. Yeah, well, and I've been following following you for a long time, so it's it's great to meet almost face to face. Uh, that, man, that, well, you've got all my info in, in, in our contact info. You keep in touch for sure. And Tom, what a pleasure to have spent some time with you. Boy, enjoy the rest of the holiday that we have today, and uh, thank you so much for your time. Stay well, and hopefully at some point I'll see you in person. But mostly, stay safe. We'll do it. You too, Dom. Thanks so much, Tom. Fantastic. All right, man.